Good morning, church. Good to see you guys all today, as well as those who are online with us today. We appreciate you being a part of worship service, not on. Well, here we are. Hey, terrific. Hey, just want to mention, this Wednesday, we are going to be uh, being a part of prayer and fasting on this Wednesday. And so we're going to kind of have a... A uh, quick walkthrough today. Lauren's going to share with us kind of a how-to, and it's in your bulletin if you want to find that today. Uh, and he's going to have a PowerPoint slide presentation too, really quick, just to kind of give us a glimpse in, as to how we can uh, best be serving our Lord as we pray this Wednesday. So Lauren, why don't you tell us a little bit about that today? Okay. All right, Wednesday, February the 24th, uh, the leadership team has gotten together and designated six days this coming year to be prayer and fasting. And so I'm going to be answering some questions about why fast. Hebrews 12, 6 tells us, it is impossible to please God, but without faith is it as possible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God wants to reward you. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said there's three things. If you do secretly, God will bless you openly. And one of those three things is fasting. Now, he starts out in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 12 saying, don't be like the Pharisees who go about with this long face, letting everybody know they're fasting. We pick up in Matthew 6, 17, but you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that you appear not unto men to fast, but unto the Father, who is in secret, and the Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. Why fast? To receive a reward from God. What time do we begin? Now, that's a good question. The time system that we use now was begun by the Romans, and the Romans used a sundial. The interesting thing about a sundial is it's not very accurate. The day, the time in the winter is shorter than the time in the summer. And uh, so... They really didn't like that, so what they decided to do was the meridian, straight up noon, and they started at some point counting time from the meridian, one hour past the meridian, two hours past the meridian. We do the same thing, a.m., p.m., but what about before uh, the Romans? Let's go back to the beginning in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness, notice, darkness was over the face of the earth. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light that it was good, and divide, God divided the light from the darkness. So we have light first, or darkness first, and then light. Now notice what he said, verse 4, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening... And the morning were the first day. You keep on reading. It says, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And the evening and the morning was the third day. So in God's opinion, a day begins in the evening. So when are we going to fast? We're going to start fasting Wednesday after, well, evening at 5 p.m. And we're going to go till Thursday at 5 p.m., and I will admit that is somewhat random that we picked 5 o'clock, but it just seemed reasonable that evening around here is going to begin at 5 o'clock. So, what do we fast from? Well, the general thing is food. It's called the water-only fast. That can pose some problems, though. The next slide. If you are on doctor-prescribed medications, we recommend you check with your doctor before fasting from food. And the reason why is there are some medications that you might be taking that require you to have food with them. And the whole purpose of this is to get closer to God, not to get a lot of people sick, okay? So if you can't fast on a water-only fast, then what are some other alternatives that you could fast from? Well, perhaps you could fast from uh, sugar or fast from technology or put the phone down. Not chocolate. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. Uh, seek God, and he will reward you. Um, we are expecting some great things to happen because of this time of prayer and fasting. 
And so we'd like to hear from you and hear exactly what's happened. So Dan, I don't know if you're in the auditorium or not. Dan is the person you need to talk to next week. Uh, Dan is the one that has kind of organized this. He spent hours. He worked with me on the PowerPoint presentation. Um, there he is. Dan, come in. He is the... Uh, He's the guy you talked to next week and said, this is what God did in my life this week, and we want to hear from you. And, uh, and then uh, Dan and the prayer team have put together a bunch of other materials. It's out in the foyer, things to pray for, how to fast. Anyway, Wednesday, February the 24th, 5 p.m. All right, please stand with me. Who you are and I'm loved by 
for God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. And you may be seated. Thank you, Hannah. Hey, folks, let's just go to prayer this morning. Father, I just thank you that you're perfect in all your ways, Lord. Because of that, Father, we can worship you today. We can lay all the burdens, all the things that we are troubled by right at your feet this morning, Father, because you are perfect. And, Father, we're going to, in just a moment, celebrate that act, the, the perfect love that you gave us by uh, given us your son, Lord God, and we remember that today. So, Father, we just uh, want to be prepared for that in our hearts and our minds this morning. Father, we're reminded of all those who are serving us today, abroad as well as locally. And, God, that's why we want to send offering to them. Lord, we want to pray for them in their endeavors. And so, God, as a small group of believers, God, may they be just encouraged by the offering that we give. So, Father, continue to be with us in this service for your glory and for your sake. In your son's name, amen. The second thing I want to do is grab one of your communication cards in your bulletin. And as Hannah plays, I want to encourage you to take that out. Jot down a prayer request, right, on one side. Maybe a praise this week, especially in light of what we're talking about for Wednesday. It's going to be tough for a handful of us. I know I really like food, <laughs> Right? Maybe that's a prayer request. Hey, I'm going to do this. Maybe it's the first time, but I want to do this. I want to see what God has for me. And, and so if you um, can do that at this time, Hannah's just going to play for a little bit, and I'll come back and uh, share a few words about communion. So do that at this time while she plays. Thank you.
Tom comes and shares with us. Can we just all take our elements? And I'm going to share a quick word from 1 Corinthians today as we consider communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Folks, let me just pray, and at that time you can partake. Father, again, we thank you for the blessing of having a relationship with you, Father, and all takes place by sending your son to die for us, Lord God, and we remember that. And Father, we, uh, we worship you today because of that knowledge. And so God, thank you for your great sacrifice. And as we partake, we remember in your son's name. Amen. And Father, we ask that you bless our time in your word as we allow it to speak to our hearts that are now open by way of song and prayer and praise and, of course, participation in communion. God, speak to us as we look now and teach us that we might be more like your son Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. If you've got your Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 8. We are going to be looking at a couple of things. I think I've got a couple slides up here I want to walk you through. Um, the first uh, thing I want to show you is the series that we've been through since New Year. We, believe it or not, we put a little bit of thought into it. I think we have that slide, or do we not? 
Yeah, it's coming. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay, so we started off with change. The idea of change, second chances, that was our New Year's resolution service, sort of, so to speak. We try to do that every year in terms of the new year. What are you thinking about the new year? What are you planning for the new year? Um, it's usually a one-off, depending on what our Christmas, where Christmas lands and where New Year's lands and that sort of thing. And this year, as I've shared with you, my, my theme, my key verse, or my, I should say my key word, is grace. And so I'm looking at grace this year and how grace is displayed by me, by our church, by uh, our ministries here. How can we display grace in a, in a greater way? And the first way we display grace, uh, this first part of the year, we're going to look at how it, it fills our life and causes us to to change. Grace, because of God's grace, I am a changed person. Then we talked about what that looks like, new mercies, the idea that every day when I wake up, God has something for me. And that change isn't just a one day, once a year resolution type change, but it's a type of change that continues. It's a, it's a journey, and God's mercies are new in that journey every morning, Scripture tells us. And then we went to the idea of Heart for the house. And heart for the house was just simply a couple of weeks where Dave and I sort of shared how you could be involved. And we'll do that throughout the year, but specifically how you could be involved in being a part of our church. And that sort of fell on Valentine's Day as well. And so it was the idea of love, the acts of love that we produce in our life that have a resounding effect in our community and in our most intimate relationships. And then the next slide, please, is uh, what we're going to be starting now, and that is the power of the gospel. This is the Lenten season. We don't celebrate Lent in a formal way here at our church, but between now and, and the Resurrection Sunday, we typically know it as Lent season. Last Tuesday was Fat Tuesday. Wednesday was the beginning of Lent, and if you don't know what Fat Tuesday is, that's where you all get to eat a whole lot of food and and and. Party with excess is kind of how that came to be, Fat Tuesday, because then people knew for 11 weeks they had to give something up for Lent. Have you ever been asked that by somebody? What are you giving up for Lent? Well, we're not asking you to, to fast for Lent. We're, can you imagine? We'd like you to fast for a number of weeks. No, we're just asking you this Wednesday to set aside a time for fasting and praying. And, and I, again, put that in big capital letters on the top of your bulletin and pick up that information out front. But we are starting this series, and it's, it has to do with the power of the gospel. How do I go about that change? How do I recognize God's new mercies in my life? How do I know what my responsibilities are in my family and in my church body? How do I know those things? Well, it's by the power of the gospel as it's demonstrated in the life of Jesus. And so we're going to be looking at the power of the gospel the next few weeks. So if you've got Matthew chapter 8, Go ahead and stand right where you are, if you would, with your Bible, or your, your phone, or your device, whatever you have, and I will read to us chapter 8. We're looking at verse 5 through verse 15, or through verse 13. Uh, it says this, When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, I say, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled, and he said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into utter darkness, and in that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then in verse 13, he says, And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Father, speak to us again as I prayed earlier through your word and show us what it means to be those who have a faith like the centurion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. And if you look at this portion of Scripture, you're going to discover some things that I find truly remarkable about what's happening here uh, in this passage. Now, the background of this passage is that Jesus had just preached the Sermon on the Mount. And he was out there uh, preaching to a number of people. He saw a number of people coming to him, uh, thousands we know, right? And, and uh, there were two opportunities that Jesus had to preach to large crowds. One was on one side of the Dead Sea and one was on the other side. And, and so as he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, 
uh, we know that we have about 5,000 men and possibly more women and children there who were there to hear the words of Jesus. So at this point in your mind, if you can kind of grasp it, this is a highlight. This is a real peak in Jesus' ministry when thousands would come to hear him speak and, and preach and teach. And he taught, as Scripture tells us, like one with authority. And he spoke so that the common man could understand him. And they did. And they, they followed him in mass. And so he's, he's at his peak. At this point in time, you could say he's the LeBron James of ministry. I mean, everybody wanted to see him, right? Everybody wanted to go watch him play. And so that made people nervous. That made the, the Sadducees nervous and the Pharisees nervous and all the other religious leaders nervous because now Jesus was was pulling people away from them and pulling people toward the true gospel and so they were getting very nervous so what happens in the ministry of jesus is he gets very 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 popular and then the leaders who have always been after him really begin to focus on coming after him but this is we could say probably part of the peak of his ministry and what he was doing so he preached at the sermon now he's walking through capernaum and people are following him uh, thousands. And the way they did that was people, some people would follow him from village to village. You know, I don't know where you live, but let's say you live in South Albany. You might follow him to North Albany. You might follow him all the way to Corvallis. But then you'd have to turn around and come home. Others would follow him in campments. And they would follow, and wherever Jesus went, they went, and they were what we could call disciples. They were the next ring, anyway, of disciples that, that followed Jesus, and they just wanted to hear more from Jesus. But then there was that little inner group, right, the 12 that Jesus traveled with, and they followed him, obviously, all the way. And so we have people who are following Jesus in Mass, and we could call them learners or seekers or some of them even disciples. And they're following Jesus, waiting on his teaching. And so as he's going through Capernaum, that's the, the background of this, he's going through Capernaum and he's already healed a man of leprosy and he's, and he's going on doing all of these healing miracles and people are taking note because people like to see examples of faith, right? They, there's something that draws us to the idea that when somebody heals somebody, their words must be that much more real. When I, when I walk through a village and people are following me, I'm Jesus, and I heal somebody of leprosy, that causes people to say, well, wait a minute, maybe this guy is legit. Maybe this guy is really the deal. Maybe I want to seek more of his teaching. Now, for you and I, that's probably not the case. I cannot remember the last time somebody in our church healed somebody in downtown Albany of leprosy. I don't know, but it doesn't happen very often. But when we do acts of love, as Dave talked about on Valentine's Day, when we do acts of love towards people, even people we don't know very well, people notice those things. And they say, I want to know why Tom would do such a thing. And why would he love on me when I don't mean anything to him? Or why would she care for me when I don't mean anything to them? And when they, re they discover that you're willing to love on them, and that love comes from a greater love than your love for Christ, they want to know that Christ. Now, it's a, it's a deeper process, and it's not nearly as fantastic as, as healing somebody, but your greatest witness are the acts of love that you show toward people around you. Sometimes love is, is easy and kind and merciful, and sometimes love is difficult. It's difficult for you to give, and sometimes it's difficult for people to receive. But the bottom line is when people see you uh, loving like Jesus loved, they're attracted to Jesus. Keep that in mind. All this year, as we talk about uh, in the greater picture, grace, right? Keep that in mind, that people will be watching you, and people will be noticing you and how you act and how you respond, especially you know, in this unprecedented year. Don't you hate that word? And, and so we're coming out of, right? We're coming out of this unprecedented year. And people are going to, they're going to know. The, the bad part of that is, is they're going to remember too. They're going to remember what you said about uh, wearing masks or not wearing masks online. They're going to remember the things you did or the things you said um, you know, about politics during this time or about other people. It, 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 unfortunately, they're going to remember we, we don't have a good ability to sort of forget those things, but they'll remember. And you'll come out of this and you'll, some of you will have lost friends. Some of you will have made new friends, allies. Some of you will say, well, why would that person act in that way? 
sometimes for the good and sometimes for the bad. But the bottom line is we're coming out of it, and it's our turn now to make an impression on the world about what we think of Jesus. Why do I love on you? Why am I caring about you? Why do I want to see you experience the love of Jesus? Because I experience that love. So let's get back to our story. This is where Jesus is. This is the background. And all of a sudden, a centurion comes to him. Look at, uh, look at the first verse there. It says, when he entered Capernaum, a centurion. Now, a centurion was uh, a Roman soldier. And when we say the word century, how many years is a century? 100 years. So a centurion is in charge of... 100 people, that's right. He's got 100 soldiers. So, so we might call him today something like a sergeant or maybe a lieutenant in our army. It's somebody who, ha- who oversees a whole group of people, at least 100. So he's a leader, and he's a centurion, and he comes forward. And that, that always, as I see that uh, verse, and I read that verse for years, I've looked at it and thought, well, that's pretty interesting. Because Jesus had people all around him, some who loved him and followed him, and some who really wanted to put his ministry to an end. And here comes a centurion, a Roman soldier, who had obviously heard of the things of Jesus, and he came in, and it says a centurion came forward. Now keep in mind, lots of people at this point in time are following Jesus, right? He just left 5,000 on a hill, and now he's walking through Capernaum, and people are following him, at least in the hundreds, and a centurion came forward close enough that he could speak to Jesus. So at some point in time, that centurion is walking, and he sees the crowd, and he just starts making his way, right, through the crowd, He didn't hang in the back and go, hey, Jesus. He didn't yell from a distance or pray from a distance. He stepped right into the crowd and made his way through. Now, I'm sure there were a lot of uh, Jewish people in that crowd who saw the centurion coming, and they sort of parted the waters, right? Nobody wants to be tapped on the shoulder by a sword. So as he's making his way through, the the crowd just sort of makes its way aside, and he gets to Jesus. When we come to Jesus, we have to make the effort. We ourselves have to sometimes plow through all kinds of stuff in our life. My kids are taking up my time. My job is taking up my time. My hobbies are taking up my time. Television is taking up my time. My computer is taking up my time. I have to ditch all that stuff. Right, And I have to come to Jesus and make my way forward, and wow, there I am. The crowd of, in my life has parted, and there's Jesus. So number one, it's, it's, it's unusual that he's a centurion, and number two, he knew he had to talk to the man. And he made his way forward, and he didn't waste any time. So the centurion comes, and he, and he says to Jesus, he comes and he says, Lord, now, and the the word they use here is appeal. Remember, it doesn't say question. It says appeal. Basically, he's giving Jesus information. He's making an appeal to Jesus. He says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Now, Jesus had to know in, in his omniscience what was going on, right? He had to know exactly what the centurion had in his heart. He knew exactly what was going on in his home, and he knew exactly what needed to be done. And I think he probably knew what was going to happen next, even though it may not seem like it in the text. I think Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen next. So the centurion comes, and he makes this this effort to get to Jesus. And he says, Lord, sir, could be a translation. Kurios is the... Greek word there, and it just means you who are in charge. So here's a centurion who could have, by right and by law, in that place and time, told Jesus what to do. He could have said, Jesus, carry my shoes back to my house. Or he could have said, Jesus, you're going to come with me, and grabbed him by the arm and taken him. But he appealed to Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He said, Lord. It reveals a couple of things. It reveals that people in that day, even those outside of the 12 and outside of those who followed, they knew who Jesus was. It also reveals that there were probably Roman soldiers who had come all the way from Italy, right, to kind of oversee and marshal the land, if you will, who heard and who were changed by the gospel, who knew who Jesus was, who had seen the very miracles that he performed. They may have been in the outer ring, or they may not have made too much noise, but there were people who were not Jewish who knew who Jesus was because of his reputation. Again, remember, this is pretty much the peak in his ministry. 
And so we see by the, the, um, the interaction here that this man appealed to someone he believed really knew what was going on, really had the power to change things, really could be the Son of God. We don't know too much about his faith, but we know he had enough faith to get there, to make his way through the crowd, and to address Jesus and call him Lord. That's pretty significant. For your quiet time, for your time with God each day, approach him. Make your way to him. Get rid of the other things that are, that are blocking your way. Maybe you have a, a prayer closet or you have a kitchen table where nobody's awake when you're, you're right there. Or, or maybe you have a, a quiet place. It might even be in your car. Maybe you go to work early and you just take 10 to 15 minutes to pray to God in your car. Maybe even a half hour and study his word in your car. But find that place and get rid of everything else and come to your Lord and say, Lord, here's my appeal today. Here's what I'm after. And that's what we see happening in the life of this, this centurion. Now, what's amazing is in verse 7, uh, Jesus gives him an answer. In verse 6, he says, Lord, my servant's paralyzed. Come, come. And Jesus says, I will come. I will come and heal him. Now, what's amazing to me about that is imagine all the requests <laughs> that Jesus would get. Imagine all the people who were reaching out from the crowd who just wanted to touch him. Uh, imagine all the people who were uh, dealing with sickness and infirmities and different things, and they just wanted Jesus' attention on them. And this particular case, Jesus understood this was a teaching moment. This was a very significant time in the life of his ministry, in the, in the time of his ministry, in the life of the Jewish people. This was a significant moment. And he says to the, to the Roman centurion, he says, I'll come. He says, I will come and heal him. Um, six words. But they were, they're pretty most profound things, I think, uh, spoken maybe in the New Testament, partly anyway. Um, I will come and heal him. Well, for one thing, it, what's unusual about that is Jewish people, and Jesus was a Jew, they were basically forbidden from going into houses of non-Jewish people. That was a tradition, a, something that had come up in their faith life, some, one of those things they tacked on. Uh, where they were absolutely uh, forbidden from going. Simon Peter had this kind of experience. He ran into that problem. Remember when he went to visit Cornelius, and after he reported that Cornelius and his whole household became believers in Jesus. Um, and, and Cornelius was a Roman centurion. Interesting. And Jesus went to his house, or excuse me, Peter went to his house, and we saw he and his house became believers. Peter must have understood the gospel was more important than a tradition. A uh, second thing, Jesus could have healed the centurion's servant right there, right? He could have just said, okay, you, you head on back home, it's done. And we'll, we'll see that in, in the text here in a little bit. But he didn't do that. He said, I'll come and I'll heal him. Um, it's never stated just why Jesus was willing to heal um, th this servant, this person. There's no uh, need to speculate, I suppose. We don't know if, the, if maybe the servant was a believer. We, we have no idea. Um, but we can be grateful that he was willing to, to show his kindness and his personal touch. But Jesus didn't do it right there on the spot. He just says, hey, I, I can come, and I'll heal him. I'll heal your servant. The third thing that's really unusual about this response is that it's a bit ominous. Um, it could have been one of the last miracles that all of Capernaum was going to witness. Remember Jesus, he, he sort of condemns Capernaum in chapter 11 uh, because in so many words, they, they just wouldn't repent. And Jesus preached repentance there. And as incredible as it sounds, Capernaum was the site of several of Jesus' miracles. And people saw them and they followed him, but they didn't accept God's message. So it's a bit ominous as we read the text in context. You see that, wow, this is a tremendous miracle he's about to, to, uh, to commit and and a number of people, this will probably be the last time they see one of Jesus' miracles. And they will walk away unfulfilled. You will minister in love to people. Uh, in prayer, deep prayer, hoping they come to the gospel. A relative or a work friend, uh, a relation in your neighborhood. or you, You'll minister to them for, for a long time and maybe they, they still walk away. I've had that happen. And uh, you don't have to stop praying for them, but you, you come to some sort of a realization at some point in time that it's, it's probably not going to happen, at least not with you. They're not going to come to Christ. And so um, it, it's a difficult thing to face. 
But even when they saw miracles performed by Jesus himself, there were many who did not accept. And we, we see that even in his uh, sort of a uh, perspective as he looks to the future, I think, in, this, in the text in just a little bit about what he says about those who are in Capernaum. But finally, it's, there's this willingness to go to the, to the centurion's home, and it, it just shows how much Jesus loved all people. He loved everybody. He was willing to go there. I don't even know if number four is in our notes, but he was willing to go. Don't ever forget that Jesus loves everybody, regardless of what they look like to you or to me or what their circumstance is. uh, Jesus was willing to go. Um, We see uh, this throughout Scripture. We see that Jesus loved people. We know that. It's no secret, uh, though, that the Jewish people hated the Romans, right, in this particular situation. Jewish people hated the Romans, and they were probably looking at Jesus. When he said, I'm going to come to your house, and I'm going to heal him, there were probably a lot of people who had been reaching out and asking Jesus time and attention, and they probably looked at him and said, what? What in the world is he doing? Well, Jesus could be unpredictable like that at times, but I think he understood, again, this was an incredible teaching moment, and it demonstrated to them that Jesus loves all people. Um, The thing we have to... uh, we have to understand is that, that he didn't make a direct appeal. Jesus, uh, the centurion didn't come to my house. He just said, this guy's sick. He's ill. You know, I, I, this is my appeal to you. Do something, you know. And, uh, and Jesus says, well, I'll, I'll go to your house and I'll heal him. So for us, with hindsight, we can say, well, Jesus loves all people. But put that into the perspective of the day. The Jewish people did not like the Romans. The, most of the Romans, I don't think, really liked the Jewish people. And what's interesting about this is Jesus makes a point that we'll get to after the centurion's reply. Because the next thing we notice is the centurion's reply. And imagine his reaction to Jesus' words. What does he say? The centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy that you have come under my roof, but only to say the word. So he's made his appeal. Jesus says, I'll come and heal him. So now the centurion sees the intent of Jesus. What's Jesus' intent? He's going to heal the guy. Right? He's going to heal the servant. And so the centurion says, hold, hold on here a second. All you've got to do is say the word. Now, I think that exhibits to us where the centurion stood in his understanding of Jesus. First of all, he calls him Lord. And then he realizes that Jesus has control over all things. Right? Jesus has authority. And he uses the example, I am a man who has authority. I, I have one who I say, go, go, and he goes. I say, when he comes, he comes. I've got you know, servants. I say, do this, and they do it. He understood Jesus' position. He understood who Jesus was. Sometimes we forget that. We love the cuddly little baby Jesus at Christmas, right? But do we really worship the, the Jesus that hung on the cross for our sins? Do we really worship the Jesus who did miraculous things? Do we really uh, worship the Jesus who knew all things, was in control of all things? You can go back to Genesis when God says, let's create this heaven and this earth and and let's do this in such a way. And you see the Holy Spirit involved and you see Jesus involved right in the very beginning of God's word. And here we have somebody who recognizes that probably better than some of us even recognize that. He recognizes the love that Jesus has, but he also recognizes Jesus' ability to fulfill those things that he loved about people and to fulfill uh, things that he had to overcome, nature, right, in all things. Jesus was, it was in authority, and uh, this soldier recognizes that Jesus was in authority. So he breaks this, these taboos. He says, yeah, I'll come to your house. And secondly, uh, that he would heal and do healing in the midst of a, a Gentile person. Here's this Roman soldier who all the Jews are looking at going, why is he paying any attention to this guy? We're the chosen folk. And, and you know, we don't, seriously, theologically, we look at that and say, that's kind of ridiculous, right? That, all the, that the Jewish people would think they were the only ones. But Jesus came to deal with the Jewish people. It, just, it doesn't mean he didn't love everybody else. It just meant that he came to present himself as their king. And they rejected that, right? And so the gospel is open to all. And Jesus knew that from the beginning of our time, from the beginning of eternity, Jesus knew this plan. And so he comes and he recognizes the soldier, which is sort of a taboo in their eyes, and he goes to 
the house, or he's willing to go to the house, which is another taboo in their eyes. They're not getting it. So here's my point. We sometimes don't get that either. We sometimes view ourselves as a church of people who are a chosen people. Well, Scripture even says we're a chosen people. But we look at ourselves like we matter more than any other people. And that's not the message that God wants to send. That's not the message that he wants us to carry out. We, you know, The ground is level at the cross. You've heard me say that before. He loves us all. And he came for us all. But who, how do we make that known today? We share that with other people. Instead of being like the Jewish people who maybe stood back and said, why would he deal with that centurion? Why would he go to his house? Maybe we need to sort of move, you know, shoulder into situations like that and say, Jesus loves this person. Jesus loves this person as much as he could love me. And there are folks who would say, well, it demonstrates a difference here between the Jews and the church, and, and there, there was a difference. I mean, like I said, Jesus came for the Jews, and he's made several promises to the Jewish nation. And I totally believe he's going to fulfill those promises. Doesn't mean he doesn't love the Gentiles. Doesn't mean he doesn't care about us. And it certainly doesn't mean that as a church, we're the new Jews, right? We're not the new Jerusalem. We are those that have been grafted into the gospel. And so Jesus wanted to show there, there will be a time. This is the teaching moment. There will be a time. Look at what he says here in the text. After, after the response of the uh, centurion, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What was Jesus telling them? What was he saying? He was saying, look, it's not all about you. This is about God's kingdom, and this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be a marvelous place where people beyond Babylon to the east, right? Beyond the sea to the west, people are going to come, and they're going to be a part of this kingdom. That, that verse should probably be underlined in every Bible that's in this room, at least. Maybe every Bible. Because it shows us, not only God's love for us, that there will be people from all over the place who come to Christ and love Jesus. They might worship a little different than we do. They might look a little bit different than we do. Their customs and their, you know, where they live might be a little bit different than ours. But the bottom line is, Jesus' teaching moment here was to tell everybody Jesus loves everyone. And he's going, his gospel is going to permeate the world. And everyone from every tribe and tongue and nation will have the opportunity to come and be a part of the kingdom of God. That's an that's a incredible teaching moment right there. Where all these people, when that dawned on them, they had to realize something about Jesus. He really is different than the other teachers that they've heard. He really is different from what they've been taught. And so what we see here is that Jesus uh, turned to them and to say, uh, there's, this is, man has great faith. Um, in fact, it says in verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled. Um, in some of your Bibles, it might say amazed. Anybody have a Bible that says amazed? Raise your hand. If you have a Bible that says one, two, okay, great, three or four. Uh, amazed is, is one of the words that they use that really uh, can be synonymous, uh, that idea of amazed or marveling. The idea is that Jesus sort of like was stepped back, sort of like maybe took him by surprise. I don't think it really took Jesus by surprise because he has that sense of omniscience. I think, though, that in the larger picture, he understood how different this man's attitude was. And in the large picture, he was like, wow, just like I'm sharing with you, this man came forward to me, a Roman soldier. That is absolutely amazing. I, I, I really do think that Jesus knew, but that he was in awe of what was going on around him. There's only two or three places, I think, in Scripture where Jesus is caught marveling at the crowd or or is amazed by what he sees. And it's not an, I don't think it's an immediate amazement like somebody came around the corner and scared him amazed. I think it's amazed like, look how this could happen. Look how people could understand who I am. And so for us, we need to amaze Jesus in that same way. We need to understand what he's saying here and, and dive in wholeheartedly in this year of grace. How does that happen in lives of people? It happens because we know there's power in the gospel that reaches beyond just blondes 
or beyond just men, or beyond just us. We have to realize there's power in the gospel, and that power has the ability to change every single life we come in contact with. Everybody. Now, it won't always happen once. It won't always happen the way we want it to happen, that's for sure. But it has the power to do that. We see it demonstrated here in the life of the centurion as he recognizes all things are under Jesus' authority there uh, in, in this passage. And Jesus heard this. He marveled. And what does he say? Jesus is, is marveling. He's amazed. And Jesus says, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Now, I don't believe that. I believe that what Jesus was doing was speaking in hyperbole. Hyperbole is when you say, oh man, I've got a million problems today, right? Well, I don't really have a million problems. Maybe I have one problem, and that's my attitude, <laughs> right? But sometimes that's how we respond. I've got a million things to do today. Well, you don't really have a million things to do. Maybe you have just a few things to do, but it feels like a million, right? Jesus says, I don't think there's faith like this anybody in Israel. Well, we know that not to be true. We know that there were people following him. We know there were people that were committed to him as disciples. And we know there was great faith in Israel. But Jesus is making a hyperbolic or high, using hyperbole there to express what was going on. This guy has a lot of faith. It's important for us to realize it wasn't, I don't think, difficult for him to have that kind of faith. Remember, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain, right? Well, here we have someone who has just enough faith to say, this Jesus, this Lord of all, this guy who has everything under his authority, he could heal my servant. He had that much faith. Some of us don't express that much faith in our everyday life. And so I see things like this happen, and if I see them happen in our church, I could just as easily marvel like Jesus. Wow, I haven't seen faith like that in anybody in our church. Well, that's, that's not really fair because I know there are very faithful people here. But what we want to understand is this should be the norm. It shouldn't be the exception. It shouldn't be the, the thing that Jesus doesn't find in our church. It should be the thing that Jesus finds. People of great faith. Are you practicing your faith in such a way that it makes an impact on those people around you? In verse 10, that's what we see is Jesus is absolutely amazed. Sometimes we forget Christ's absolute humanity, you know, when he gets amazed like that. His ability to love or show anger, experience hunger and thirst, or to be amazed. But I think it comes from a deeper place. I think it comes from his understanding of what people's faith is like. He knows what your faith is like. He knows what my faith is like. He knows where I lack. He knows where I'm weak. And all he's saying is, hey, you know what? If you had as much faith as a centurion, look what could happen. Look what could happen in your life if you had that much faith, if you trusted me that much. Jesus expressed something that might be easy to miss here. He mentioned that he had not seen that, that great faith in, in Israel, and we don't want to miss that because what he's saying to us is he wants to see great acts of faith. He wants to see us dive in. How does grace enter into somebody's life? By way of the power of the gospel. Well, that's great. We know the gospel to be true and right, but how does the gospel intersect somebody's life? It intersects somebody's life because I have faith in the gospel, and I intersect somebody's life. Make the connection? If I've got faith, and I intersect somebody's life, then, then grace is going to be seen by them. It's going to be recognized by them. They're going to, they're going to be curious about this Jesus character because of my faith entering into their life? Do you have that kind of faith that has an impact on the lives of people? Good question to ask today. So Jesus is, is amazed. We see that in this passage. But then Jesus goes on to, to give us some more additional information. Look at what he says at the end here in, in verse 13. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Now, it's interesting that the gospel says at that very moment, I think, because um, there was nobody that could verify that unless word got back to the writers of the gospel that the centurion went home and he verified maybe with another servant or with family members that 
right about the same time Jesus was saying that, this servant was healed. But one of the things that we want to remember, especially in the Old Testament and the Gospels, that is, there's a, there's a distinction between um, Jewish people and, as the chosen people and the rest of the human race. And so here we see Jesus intersecting in the life of this centurion and completely changing his life, and the, especially the life of his servant. So in our, in our mind's eye, what, what do we imagine the, the centurion was like after this experience? My guess is he, if he was not uh, completely committed to Jesus at that point, he probably became a disciple of Jesus. You know, he may have approached Jesus because his servant was a believer. But we know what slavery was like in those days, and we know what servants did in those days. And honestly, when I read this story, I think the this, this centurion could have said, well, let that one die, I'll just buy another one. Right? But that's not what happened. There was some sort of a relationship there. There was a love that he had for that servant, that he wanted the servant to be healed. We don't know that he was a believer, but he came to Jesus and said, my servant needs to be healed. Now, maybe the servant believed in Jesus. Maybe the centurion had had enough of the servant's faith rub off on him that he believed this is all just supposition on my part. Maybe the centurion had been a believer for a while, couldn't admit it to his superiors, couldn't admit it to the men he was in charge of, but maybe he knew about Jesus already. Maybe he had come into contact with Jesus somewhere along the, along the way. We don't know. But I bet that after this experience, his life was not the same as he saw Jesus the centurion overall, right? The one who commands everything and all things come under his authority, healed his servant. Well, there's this distinction. The people stood back. I'm sure they were, they were concerned. Why is Jesus mingling with this man? But we see it all through the Old and New Testament that Jesus loves everybody. And that's sort of the message, the key message to this whole passage. He loves everybody. And we need to reflect that love of people. But just a quick reminder that there were others who who came into Judaism before, as they recognized the power of God even before Jesus came. Rahab the harlot came. Uh, Ruth was a Moabite, but she became a believer. Uh, in the book of Esther, it tells how a lot of people in the Medo-Persian Empire, remember we went through Esther this summer, this last summer, and you learned how many people were converted to Judaism because of what happened with Esther. Um, Nicholas of Antioch, if you... Um, were to look through Scripture, a Gentile, he, he became a Gentile who became Jewish, who then understood who Jesus was and became a convert to the early church. Um, he was one of the first seven deacons in the, in the early church. So we see this happening throughout history. What we need to get is the big picture, and that is that Jesus loves everybody. He loves everybody. He was a Savior for those who became Jews and then believers, but also even for the Jews themselves. How does a Jewish person go to heaven? Same way you do. They trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They recognize him as their Messiah. That's how they go to heaven. So we see in this, in this uh, passage here, he says, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that time. Uh, Jesus taught the people of Capernaum exactly what they needed to hear, which was, I love everybody, and the kingdom of God is accessible for everybody. But unfortunately, we find later on that many people in Capernaum did not have time for Jesus' message. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to follow it. They loved the miracles. They loved the good things. And we see that today. We love the activities at the church. Boy, I love the fellowship. Gosh, I really like the worship. Well, I really like my Bible study. My care group's tops for me. But what we're really after is the heart, right? You can come and make your way through all those things and never really get it in the heart. And what we want to understand this morning is, is that Jesus loves everybody. And we need, they need to understand that in their heart. And they're going to understand that when you and I take that love out into the community and we go and we say, hey, this is what Jesus' love is like. And when they see that love through us, they're going to want to experience the same kind of grace that we experience. So I want to encourage you this morning, as you look at this paragraph of Scripture, the power that is in it and the power that's represented in it that, that is uh, designated to the gospel, the gospel can change lives, every single life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and for the gospel as it can change lives. 
We are so grateful for all that you've done through your son Jesus from eternity forward, Lord God, in as time as we understand it, that he's come. He helped create us, but he's come to save us. And we echo the, the call from centuries, which is, come, Lord Jesus, come soon. We pray, God, that he would come, that our salvation would be complete because he came. But until he does, Father, we pray that you would help us to be evidence of the love and the grace that you've, you've given us and that that love might be shown in our community, that that love might lead others to a place of seeking your great grace, seeking you as their Lord and as their Savior. Just as I've got your eyes closed for a moment, if you have not considered this in your life, you need to take a moment to consider Jesus as Lord. Not as, a, as the cute baby in the manger and not as the, the wonderful uh, pink, lilified Jesus in Easter as he's coming from the grave. and not, not even the Jesus that's on the cross that you know brought salvation, but the Jesus who knows you. Consider for a moment the Jesus who knows you and ask yourself, do I want to be known? I would pray this morning that you would want Jesus to know you, that you would want to make him your Savior, that you would want him as your own. And so I would pray that you would simply ask him, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and be my Lord, be my Savior from this moment forward. And if you can repeat that prayer, then you know that God has come. He's brought his Son and his Son is here to enter and sit on the throne of your heart where he belongs. You can be confident of that fact. Lord, as we close our time this morning, help us to realize what the centurion realized and the people around Jesus realized, that he came for all people, that he loves all people, that he wants to be in our hearts and know us well. Father, we love you and we trust you and we thank you for your good word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing one last uh, song before we go this morning? I see the king.
break my heart. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk from earth into eternity. pray for us. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to shout Hosanna. We thank you for the chance to go from this place, regardless of our circumstance, place our faith in you and do it in such a way that it impacts those of us or those around us. Father, we thank you for the gospel and the tremendous power it has to change the life of a centurion, to change the life of those who follow to change the life of each individual here on earth today. Help us to be the vessel for that, the tool for that, that we might share your great love for us and that, that grace might visit on the lives of others around us. We love you, Lord, and we trust you for these things as we go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Don't forget to pick up your fasting materials on the table out front. Make sure you got a mask on and say hi to somebody you don't know. <laughs>